Right, our first, um, our next, the first speaker of, the, of this, this last uh, session is Ed Wright, and he is president of X Rocket, and uh, he, he's going to be giving us a, a totally different perspective on space tourism, and uh, uh, so over to Ed Wright. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I think it's somewhat interesting coming to these and, and seeing that um, there's sort of a convergence between some of the smaller companies and some of the larger companies. You know, they're starting to adopt some of our ideas. Um, Ellen Ladwick and I came here and we, we both had the idea of coming in uniform. But, you know, there's sort of a difference in interpretation between the large companies. On, us sometimes, you know. I came in my own uniform, and Alan, who's from north of Bremen, came in one of his competitors. Okay, um, the joke would have been a lot funny if Alan hadn't left the room. Uh, anyway, I'm here to talk to you about the Rocket Academy. Uh, this is a concept being developed by X Rocket LLC. Our company motto, as you can see, is space flight for the rest of us. And this is just sort of a graphical illustration, which is kind of washed out by the lighting, I guess. Um, I want to talk somewhat about the sort of business that we're in. We are in the business of marketing space exploration. The dictionary says that exploration is travel for purposes of discovery. And we are really a travel company. We want to give people the opportunity to travel into space to discover things that they would not be able to discover here on Earth. And again, travel is also a very important component of this. People talk about unmanned space exploration, but the dictionary says exploration is travel for purposes of discovery. Sitting in front of a television set, playing a video game, being in a mission control room is not exploration in the dictionary sense because you are not traveling. We want to give people the opportunity to actually fly. Now we're also taking a paradigm called experience marketing. In the early days of civilization prior to the internet, the first businesses were involved in extracting things from the earth. People were involved in hunting, gathering, eventually mining, digging things out of the ground, agriculture, growing things. These are called extractive industries, what economists call primary industries. Later on, we had an industrial revolution. People learned to make things and start producing things. These are called secondary industries. Eventually, people started making so many things that they just couldn't consume any more things. So they wanted services, they wanted people to be able to bring the food to their table in nice restaurants. These are called service industries. Today, we're moving to a new level, what are called experience industries. Uh, there's a book, which was referred to earlier, The Experience Economy, which talks about this new trend. If you aren't in the experience business, you are already obsolete. If you look at businesses like Starbucks, they don't grow the coffee, okay, they, they, they process it and brew it for you and, and they serve it to you, but what you're paying for is not the service because you can go out and get someone to serve you coffee for 50 cents a cup. You go to call Starbucks and you pay $4 a cup because you're getting the Starbucks experience. Other examples of businesses that have learned to do experience marketing include Southwest Airlines. Okay, you go there and you buy a ticket and you get a cheap flight, but you also get insulted by the stewardesses. That's an important part of the experience. Apple Computer. You go out and you buy an iPod or an iMac, not simply because you need something to play your music on. You can do that with a CD-ROM 
or, or one of those little Walkman CD players which have been around for years and you can still buy them for like 12 bucks. But an iPod gives you an experience that you don't have from some of those earlier products. Pixar, or for that matter, any motion picture company, is in the experience business. People go to movies because they want an experience. Disney, especially in the old days, was very much about the experience business. Um, Michael Eisner has screwed that up a bit lately, but I'm not here to talk about that. Las Vegas is very much an experience business. People don't go out to Las Vegas for the climate. They don't go there because you have to go to Las Vegas to get people bringing you drinks. They go there because they want to experience something which is not available in the part of the country where they live. Now, I want to talk about the way X-Rocket is implementing experience marketing at the Rocket Academy. First of all, we are not a theme park. A lot of people have talked about using the theme park model for space tourism, especially for suborbital businesses. Unfortunately, when you start looking at the theme park model closely, you'll find that it does not work for this type of business. And here's why. Successful theme parks operate on a very high volume business, millions of visitors per year. But people are not going to come at your theme, to your theme park just to watch the rocket fly and then go home. If they come to a theme park, they expect to be there for six to eight hours. That means in addition to your rockets, you need other attractions, you need food, you need souvenirs, you need all these other things to take care of people for six to eight hours. Now, if you size a park for a million attendees, which is a moderately successful theme park, you need to spend somewhere between 70 and 120 million dollars to provide all those things for them. 70 to 120 million dollars, and that doesn't even include the rockets, the launch facilities, and so on. That's just what you need for any theme park this size. Suddenly, you've gone from a suborbital business where you might be able to build a fleet of vehicles for $20 million to a business where, in addition to the $20 million for the vehicle, you need 70 to 120 million for all these other things. And then there's the question of where are these people going to stay? If you're someplace like Mojave, or perhaps someplace even more isolated, there aren't a lot of hotels around. You may need to build hotels in addition to this and your investment goes up even more. But, even though your park development costs are now over 10 times the cost of your rocket fleet, everything still depends on having the rockets because those are your e-tickets. If you don't have the rockets, people are not going to come to your park. So the amount of money that you're investing, the amount of capital you have at risk, has suddenly gone up 10 times, but you haven't reduced the amount of risk. As a business proposition, this does not look particularly attractive. Fortunately, even though the traditional theme park model does not really work, there are certain things from the theme park business certain lessons that we can extract and use in our own business. There are boutique models that the theme park industry has been developing over the past several years. These are very interesting to us. And to a large degree, the Rocket Academy is going to be based on some of these new boutique models. Um, could, could you go back to Okay. Another lesson is that when you look at successful parks, they require a very high degree of capital reinvestment from 50% on up. During the early days, Walt Disney reinvested every dime Disneyland 
made back into the park. In fact, he reinvested about 110% into the parks. Michael Eisner hasn't done that. That's one reason why the Disney parks are suffering today. A lot of people who have talked about using the theme park model have the idea that, oh, we'll get started in the theme park business and we'll make a lot of money and then we'll pull the money out to go off and launch satellites or something else. If you look at the history of successful theme parks like Disney in the early years, again, this does not work. You need to reinvest the money to keep the park going or your business is going to fail. Disney said that Disneyland would be a place that was always in the process of becoming. That's something that's very, a very important idea. That's also one of the basic core principles of the Rocket Academy. We want to establish a business, a place where people can come to that is always in the process of becoming. The Rocket Academy will always be evolving, always changing, always adding to the experience, but we are not going to pull a lot of money out to go off and launch satellites. We're going to use it to enhance the experience for the visitors. There was some talk about immersion earlier, and, and someone said this is a new idea in developing in the 2000s. This is actually not really that recent an idea at all. This actually, again, goes back to Walt Disney when he was still alive. Disneyland operated on a principle called immersion toward interesting illusion. The idea of immersing, immersing, there must be a verb in here somewhere. <laughs> Immersing people into this reality that Disneyland had created for the first time. And one of the principal key elements of this is that Disney realized the people running the park must never wink. You must never deliberately do something that tells people you don't know this is real. That it's a game you're playing. People want to live the illusion. The Rocket Academy is taking this one step further. Disneyland had an immersion toward interesting illusion. We are going to immerse people in interesting reality. Everything we do is real. People will come to the Rocket Academy not to see a simulation of a space flight center, a simulation of a spaceport, a simulation of space travel, but to be part of a spaceport, to be part of an actual launch process, to take part in space travel. We believe that high tech needs to be mapped with high touch. People actually have to be able to go out touch the hardware. It isn't enough to go to some place like Kennedy Space Center and see a shuttle in the distance. You need to be able to experience it with all of your senses. NASA has this saying that they've used talking about the, the space shuttle over the years, the dream is alive. Well, from our point of view, the theme is alive. It's actually a living experience that we're providing to people. Now, looking at the suborbital business, what we see developing are two market segments. You have a group of companies that are developing vehicles that I call the, the suborbital tour van. The, these are vehicles that carry anywhere from four, eight people, perhaps more. Uh, relatively shirt sleeve type environment. Perhaps you can get out of your seat and float around. And these are vehicles that will achieve economy by carrying a lot of passengers on each flight. This is generally what people think of when they talk about suborbital tourism. 
Another market segment is what I call spaceflight training. Here you'll have vehicles that are more well, built and designed more along the lines of aerospace trainers. There'll be two place vehicles with a pilot and a student pilot. Both of them will have controls. You'll actually have your hands on the control stick throughout the entire flight. You'll wear a space suit. That's an important part of the experience. You know, space suits are cool. There's a certain segment of people that want to look like astronauts. And it's a much more personalized, customized experience. It's also much more of an educational experience. You're actually learning about the vehicle because you're going to be helping to pilot the vehicle. I'm not saying that one of these segments is more viable than others. I'm sure there'll be a number of successful businesses in both of these. However, the space flight training segment is the one that we're targeting at the Rocket Academy. Now, as an example, the aerospace trainer, this is Archangel. It's a modification of a Russian MiG-21 UM airplane, a very popular common airplane. The Russians built about 14,000 MiG-21s during the Cold War. Um, something like 3,000 of them were two-seat trainers, and I believe about 30% of those are still operating worldwide. What we do is to replace the turbine engine entirely with four 5,000-pound thrust X-Core rocket engines. Uh, the engines go back here in this boat tail, which we need to add for weight and balance reasons. Uh, getting the weight and balance right on this design is actually the trickiest part, and it, it's the really the only proprietary part, therefore I won't talk about that. However, can you? What this gives us is a vehicle that can zoom climb to about 160 to 198,000 feet, depending on how development turns out. Uh, some people will say, well, that's not technically outer space. Okay, it's not technically outer space, maybe, but I think if you want to try living without a pressure suit at that altitude, you'll survive about as long as you would at ISS. Uh, really, as far as physiology is concerned, the only difference is that you will have a shorter period of weightlessness. Uh, you'll be maneuvering on reaction control thrusters above 100,000 feet, operating as a spacecraft. Um, you have about 100,000 foot per minute rate of climb, about 3 or 4 Gs on re-entry, reach Mach 2.5 on re-entry. Um, and this is something that we can do for a relatively small investment compared to a lot of other vehicles. The way we're going to make money with this vehicle is not by carrying a lot of passengers on each flight like Bert Rutan will do, but by operating this vehicle many times a day on a very short rapid turnaround basis. One of the reasons why we picked the 21UM airframe, is that it's a very easy airplane to maintain. American airplanes are designed to be serviced by Air Force mechanics with, with this huge supply train behind them. They're designed to be babied. The MiG-21 was designed to be sold to third world air forces all over the world and serviced by mechanics who in many cases, had probably never driven a car before they were drafted into the Army and someone told them they were going to be a mechanic. Or they slipped the recruiting sergeant 50 bucks to make them a mechanic instead of a rifleman. Um, to give you an example of how easy this airplane is to maintain, uh, we, we did an oil change uh, between a couple of our flights last year. Uh, we, we actually, the people we had doing the oil were not a and P mechanics, they were actually cell phone salesmen. Uh, they worked for our sponsor at the time. Uh, yes, we made our sponsor change the oil, and uh, by the way, th th they actually liked it. 
Um, we also have done a high speed sortie test, uh, high rate sortie test. Uh, we started out trying to prove that we could do three flights one day and one the, the following day. Um, unfortunately, it looked like the weather was going to be bad, so, so we ended up speeding things up a bit. Uh, it turns out we, we, we did four sorties within seven hours. Uh, it would have been six hours, but we stopped to go to McDonald's for lunch. In addition to the ultimate elevator ride, the Rocket Academy will offer a full experience, including classroom instruction, simulator sessions, physiology and pressure suit training, as well as a safety and survival course. Basically, when you come to us, you will be getting a mini version of what you get going through any astronaut training course. Or, if you want to stay long enough and pay enough money, you can get the full version. We are going to have course offerings which will range from space familiarization, teacher in space classes, to more professional, long-term training for test pilots, people from Edwards Air Force Base, or, or any other test pilot school who want to come and learn about rocket flight, will be able to do that with us. We'll be able to train space flight engineers payload specialists who want to learn how to operate experiments will be able to come. Uh, if you have your own experiment which you want to bring to fly with us, we have a hard point, we'll be able to accommodate that. For researchers, we have a number of advantages that we can offer. We can offer rapid reflight, low costs per flight, flexible scheduling, We'll have educational day programs for people who can't afford the, the flight experience, don't want to go on the flight experience, or, or simply too young to get their parents to let them go. Uh, we'll have various programs set up for teachers and professors, college classes, K-12 groups, families and youth groups. If a Boy Scout troop wants to come, uh, we'll have experiences for them. There'll be longer, what we call academy experiences, which are sort of a week-long version in which you'll get essentially everything except the actual flight. You'll get to have the experience of classroom instruction, there'll be tours of the facilities, simulator sessions, again, the whole enchilada except for the flight. And we'll have a space flight museum and visitor center set up where you can go and you can watch the actual live rocket launches. Uh, they'll make movies and exhibits. Um, at this point, uh, pe people often ask me, what are you going to charge for these flights? Um, well, I I'm not going to say that in front of my competitors. Uh, if, if you're seriously interested, we can talk about that publicly. Uh, the, the only thing I, I will say in front of an audience is that we intend to charge more than it costs us to conduct the flights and less than our competitors. Are there any questions? Uh, no, um, right now we, we, we are flying out of uh, Reno Steadfield. Um, this is where they hold the national championship air races. Uh, but during the rest of the year, it's it's basically uh, your average ordinary general aviation airport, with, with with the exception of the fact that most of the planes that fly out of there happen to be MIGs. Uh, Question. Yeah. Do you have any special FAA? Um, right now, we, we, we are flying as an experimental airplane, uh, we, we, which means we, we, we cannot carry 
people for hire or cargo for hire. However, we are licensed as exhibition class experimental, so, so we can do air shows and, and so on. Uh, we, we also have a waiver from the FAA allowing us to do pilot training. Uh, in, in the next phase, we, we will be a suborbital vehicle, so we will be able to do all the things that suborbital vehicles are able to do legally. Um, as far as our location is concerned, uh, you know, we, we, we're going to be based in the United States. As I said, right now we're operating out of Reno. We will be relocating to Mojave because that's where our airframe vendor is. and. Eventually, we expect we'll have two operational spaceport sites in the U.S. because one thing that a lot of people have not yet realized is that when you're talking about tourism type businesses, these are highly seasonal. People like to take their vacations during certain times of year. So we want to have a location in a northern latitude state such as perhaps Montana where we can operate during the summer and get more hours of daylight during the summer if you can get in even one additional flight per day, it makes a big business, a big difference in your business model. But at the same time, we need to have a site in a more southern location because we also need to be able to operate year round. And you can't do that in Montana when there's six feet of snow on your runway. Yes. How long do you anticipate your pilot training course to last? Um, the pilot training course can last as long as you want. Um, it depends on what type of training you want, uh, how thoroughly you want to be trained. Uh, right now, to, to convert a experienced jet pilot who wants to get a type rating in a MiG-21, uh, it, it takes us about seven flights to do that, and um, the, the, the cost for that is probably about $30,000. Could you tell us your website? Our website is www.xrocket.com with, with a hyphen, x hyphen rocket. One more question. No? Okay, all right. Thanks very much.